Okay, first and foremost, if you did not catch part one with Andrew Gross, you got to go back and listen to it because he takes us through this framework for how he's navigated market competition and the implications for the mattress business. But we, we, we had like a big hard stop, a big cliffhanger in episode one so that we could bring it back for episode two. Well, yeah, Andrew's getting ready to tell us the, the keys to the universe and we shut him down. So sorry about that, Andrew. Um, r- real quick story. Um, I, I, I don't know if you remember this conversation, Andrew, but <clears throat> it'll segue into what we're about to talk about. But we were talking about something at the time and I was at Leggett and we became friends over time with you at CERTA and we would talk about marketing things and we, we had some really good conversations. And at one point you were giving me some advice on something and you could tell on the phone call that I was clearly annoyed or irritated <laughs> And where the conversation had gone. And you know, when, when you're talking to someone and someone's getting you, uh, feeding you some truth that doesn't sit necessarily well, it has a, temp- a tendency yeah. to like fire you up a little bit and it shuts you down or frustrates you or whatever it was. So you were telling me th- some things that were true and I was getting frustrated. And you go, Mark? I go, yes, Andrew. He said, just remember, feedback is a gift. Do you remember that? And I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I have thought about that moment. And I'm like, I've even t- told my kids about it. Whenever someone's giving you truth and you're like, I don't know about that. Anyway, it just cracked me up. And I, I still remember that conversation. So, Well, you know what? <laughs> I use that uh, every uh, employee reviewer conversation with someone that worked for me. I always remind them that feedback's a gift. And then uh, if they didn't like something I said, I always reminded something that I was told is that when it comes to managing people, uh, if you're the boss, your perception is your, uh, is your employee's reality. Yeah, that's true. And I said, oh. thanks for the gift. It's a crappy gift. I'm taking it back. <laughs> yeah. You can take it back, but no, 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 I'm not going to no, no. change my perception. Yeah, that's right. No, well, while, exactly. while feedback is a gift, just remember, guys, unsolicited advice is abuse. Ooh. Yeah. Well, that we could have a whole podcast about that kind of stuff, right? Uh, Andrew, we left off, and you're you're getting into some really good stuff. So let's pick up right where we left off, which was um, we were talking about um, some things and how you see the industry today. And yeah. through your lens, you've had some time to sit back and kind of look at things. Uh, so let's talk about some of that and um, kind of where things are and and where you see things kind of going. Sure. So I see a few big trends. I think the first one is that um, there's a big opportunity in home and health. Uh, you know, just first of all, you got to make an assumption that COVID is going to be around for a little while. And, you know, I'm not, I, this is not meant to uh, turn this into a political argument, but one way or the other, whether there's a therapy, vaccine, herd immunity, herd immunity et cetera, it's going to be around for a while. And you're seeing the impact that that has on depressing industries like travel, hospitality, entertainment, and those dollars going to the home because people are staying close to the home and they want to upgrade the home. They want greater experiences in the home, outside the home, et cetera. So that I think is a huge growth area. And that's some of what's fueling the numbers that you're seeing right now in the, in the bedding industry. And then health is the other part of it. So I know you guys always talk about, and lots of people talk about how you have to elevate this industry from talking about the attributes of a mattress to better sleep, but you need to go another level from better sleep to better health. And if you see what's going on, for instance, with sleep tracking apps and the research around sleep, a lot of it is now linked to or or toward into overall health regimes. Look at uh, what the NBA is going to do when they, when they restart, start in Orlando, right? They're giving every player an aura ring Mm -hmm. because there's a data now emerging that if you track, you know, whether it's your sleep patterns or your resting heart rate, et cetera, sometimes you can see signals of infection before you actually see that infection manifest itself. Mm. And so I think that's also a big opportunity to think about how this product plays on a, on a, a in a broader health arena. And so I see that the, you know, home and health is big opportunities. Um, the next one is just acceleration of e-commerce. I mean, you know, COVID has thrown gasoline on the fire of e-commerce. You know, there's some data out there that says that e-commerce went from 17% of retail in total to 27% at one point. I know Mark and I were talking before this started that, yeah, that's going to come back a little as retail opens, but behaviors are changing and people are becoming more comfortable. And that doesn't mean that everything is going 
100% to pure e-commerce. It may be that now transactions are starting more online and people may still want to go to a store, but it's going to play into your, how you play omni-channel. How do you create, for instance, um, you know, the ability to create appointments or to create online appointments or increase your chat ability, create those touch points that exist in an online arena. Um, third one for me is that there's, the, you know, we're going to assume that the next anti-dumping uh, petition is going to get approved and there's going to be a window of opportunity for the domestic industry to take advantage of that. But at some point, water is going to seek its level. Importers are going to continue to set up U.S. operations or Mexico operations or another low-cost country like Poland, for instance. And there's going to be a window there to figure out how do I seize back some of the business and the value segment and reposition it. But that, door, but that window will open and it will close. So you need to figure out how you're going to take advantage of it. And then the fourth one, which I think is really important to this audience, is that I think local is going to make a big comeback. And it's driven by the fact, again, that people are staying closer to home um, in the midst of all this COVID stuff and everything going on politic, uh, politically, there's a much more, you see it in surveys about stronger attitudes around buy American and buy local. And I think that's an opportunity for the local retailer. It's an opportunity for the independent local manufacturer to stress their roots um, and take, take advantage of that. Um, and then I got one more, the last one is, that um, you got to recognize in this business as a salesperson, your competition now is the, you know, some people call the middle funnel, the review sites. There's no other business I've come across that has such a profusion of review sites that have earned so much traffic. And if you don't understand what they're saying about your products or your, even your store, you're in a, you're in a point of deficit. And that trend alone is something we've spent a fair amount of time talking about because whether the reality accurately reflects what the product is about, how it performs and what it means to your consumer doesn't really matter because whenever people get into the search phase, like it or not, the billboards that are flashing right in front of them are what's on the first page of Google and the second page of Google and review sites have figured out how to own that real estate, how to keep those search results elevated and they understand the algorithm, they understand how to pivot very quickly, they understand the nature of content and how to put it out. And like I said, whether you like it or not, the reality is the consumer is coming in to your store, if they do come into your store, primed with certain information, they're finding on those review sites, which appear trustworthy. And that's what this is gonna come down to. You're gonna be fighting that fight. I think one of the keys to that is gonna be education. So not only being educated as a salesperson and as a retailer, but understanding how you can bridge the education gap for the consumer and how you can help them understand this site may be unsavory and here's why. And being able to, being able to keep up with those things so that you can explain it to them. What's, what's your take on how the review sites could continue to impact the industry and where that might be going? Um, well, listen, they're, they're taking a huge amount of traffic. They certainly know how to play the game. Uh, and in terms of uh, creating new content that's relevant to consumers, um, they've certainly tried to play the broader sleep game. So look at the deal between uh, Talk and, and the NSF. Um, and the numbers are just extremely large. I think it puts a lot of pressure that whether you're a manufacturer or retailer, everybody in the world today is a content creator. Look at YouTube. You're, you're content creators, right? Um, and if, if, if I'm a retailer, I got to think about how do I create more content around the products and services that I offer that on a local basis can counter some of those review sites. Again, I go back to those principles of warfare. If I'm a local retailer, most of my business is going to come from the areas that are closest to my stores. And with things like geotargeting and geofencing and your use of kind of some offline media to drive online media, you got to put up a, a wall around that and say, in those areas, I really am the expert and, and, and I own this category. And that's not just about the marketing media you use, but it's also about your ability to create content. And content these days, the ability to create content doesn't cost a lot of money. It's not costing us a lot of money to create this podcast. And people are so much more comfortable like, with the production values that you don't have to be intimidated by the fact that you know, production values have to be great. But if you have 40 beds in your department, you should be able to talk about all of them. 
and the relative merits and strengths um, and, and what people read online. So I, I think that's the big opportunity for retailers. You know, here's, here's the thing, you guys, if you, if you think about the, the review sites, it's yeah. also, isn't it the, the originating source, right? Mm -hmm. So the review sites today, we, we go online and we're looking for a bed. We don't know the review sites that we come across, right? We're in the search phase. So we need to learn our way into buying this mattress that we yeah. don't want to buy to begin with. So the local retailers have a major advantage if they've done the right job of building a connection to the people in their market. Because if that guy tells me that these beds are good for X, Y, and Z, I'm much more likely to buy into that than I am some random review site. But if the website for that retailer is absent of any content helping me to make a good buying decision with a educational piece to that, then, then you're gonna, the, the local retailer is going to give that ground up to these fake review sites that are all about just driving clicks and links and affiliate fees, right? Right, uh, and, and think about it. A lot of these sites got started by, you know, one or two people in their apartment creating content. Right. So it, it you know, it, it's not about um, the amount of resource you have. It's a lot of it's about effort and saying, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in the business of creating, you have to set yourself targets. So I'm going to create, you know, listen, if I have 35, 40, 40 models, I'm going to create something new every day. If I know that these are the questions or issues that people are asking me about betting, I'm going to create content around that. Like, um, you know, one of the areas I always found frustrating in this category is, you know, it's, it's hard to explain to people what's the difference between kind of, uh, you know, a firm, medium and soft bed. And I still don't find a lot of content online that really explains that and demonstrates that. It goes back to what I talked earlier about that tactile thing. You can even show it visually, right? So I, I still think that there's a lot of opportunities out there. And then if you localize it, you can be the relevant expert in your area. It goes back, I said, back to those principles. You gotta figure out how to fight the battle on a battlefield where you have a greater chance of winning. If you just put up your hands and say, well, I can't compete with all these big online people that have 800 million visitors a month and all that. That's the wrong way to think about it if you're a local retailer because what you're concerned is about, well, how much traffic is in your backyard? Let's, let's actually pause there. So yeah. we're talking with Andrew Gross, former yeah. EVP of Serta. Uh, he's, he runs, oh, okay, before I do my major reset, tell us the name of your consultancy and how you got that name. Yeah, so I set up a small consulting operation. It's called 12 Squared, and it was pretty simple. Uh, 12 times 12 equals 144 equals one gross. Andrew Gross, perfect. Andrew Gross. Well, we, we love uh, picking your brain, and we've you know, been friends over the years, and we've seen your career progress and the impact that you've had on the industry unfold. And, and I think it's a really good kind of dovetail to talk about these online, reviews, these online review sites in relation to the principles that you laid out in the last episode. So again, if you haven't listened to that last, last episode, go back and give it a listen and really absorb it. Grab a pen and paper because I think you'll find some really good notes. But Andrew takes you through these three principles from the Lanchester strategy model. Number one is your goal is to be number one in whatever you do. Concentration is key and then battles are fought to be won. So take it from an independent retailer's perspective. And you feel like you're fighting this multi-front battle called the internet. And then you're going to apply these principles to your business. How would you be thinking about that? Well, it's a great, it's a great question. So the first thing I think you have to do is you have to define the, the, uh, the battleground, which is first think about your market. Where do you sit in your market? Are you number one in your market? Because it's a different answer if you're number one. But if you're not number one and you want to get to be number one in, in your market, which includes, you have to think in your mind, how much online sales from people outside the market are being done. You know, national retailers are being done in your market. Think about where you stand, because that's really going to drive then your strategies from there. So for instance, if you're number two or number three, your first question in mind is not, you know, what most people think about is, what am I going to do to be better than number one? You know, big, bad. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Quinn's uh, Furniture and Appliance. And big bad Kinsley's is the number one player in the market. Here's the thing. I eventually want to beat 
Big Bad Kinsley. But in order for me to beat Big Kinsley first, what I'm gonna do with Mark Quinn as, as uh, Quinn's Furniture and Appliance is I'm gonna do the thing that my mother said I shouldn't do, which is I'm gonna beat up on the little kids in the playground. <laughs> You're not going to focus on number one. You're not focusing on Big Bad Kinsley. You're focused on somebody else. Right. The first thing is you have to find that market can I, area. Can I just right? draw a point out here real quickly? So okay. in the first episode, if you go back and listen, yeah. there were two wars that were fought. Kinsley mm -hmm. won both wars in the example you just gave. And yeah. now he's the big bad friend. I haven't won anything. Now he's the big furniture store and I'm number two. Like, yeah. when do I get to win a war or one of these market share battles? Do you have an example coming up where I get to be on top of that? Uh, hopefully. We'll, we'll see how good you are, um, Quinn. Okay. <laughs> I digress. But my, Go my, ahead. My, my, my is, number one. I get it. Okay. okay. You're, so say you're, you're Quinn, you're number three. And yes, you're saying, listen, I'm, I'm freaked out about the big ad that Kinsey's running or what's going on in Amazon or Wayfair. But you know what? I looked at my market and there are six other guys that are selling um, in my category and they're smaller than me. So your first question is to say, how do I get share from them? Because I have the advantage over them. And so say whether it's I have to offer something in terms of my product, my selection, my service, or I can uh, do something with my marketing and geofence my marketing around one of their op operations. And let me get share from them. Because when I get share from them, I get bigger. When I get bigger, I have more money to spend, more salespeople, more resources, et cetera. So that's one of the things that in that strategy about um, basically figuring out where you can be number one, right? Where you can create a battle where you can be number one that concentration and focus is very, is very important. And what we often get distracted is, is we're all focused on, I wanna go after the big guy, I wanna go after Kinsley's. Or um, I'm feeling threatened by the business that's being taken away by an Amazon or Wayfair or someone else. When the reality is the first thing you have to look in your market and say again, going against your mother's advice, are there other people that I should beat up on first that I can take share from? Because if I can take share from them, I can get bigger and stronger. And so to, to go back to the example I used in terms of, you know, how the team built CERTA, you know, they took over licensees in each of those markets. They went in those markets and said, who are the retailers that we can partner with? And they may not be the number one retailer, but rather than focusing my efforts with maybe 40 or 50 retailers, I'm going to concentrate that effort and with, in partnership with that person, get bigger and bigger that I ultimately can be number one. Right. So that's, that's the, um, you know, the example I would use for uh, Quinn's Furniture and Appliance versus Big Bad Kinsley's World, or whatever we're going to call uh, the name of his retailer, is figure out where you can concentrate that effort. If that means beating up on little guys, take share from them, do that, because then you'll start to grow your, your, um, your business and your size and your, and your uh, resources over time, but then you can challenge that big leader. So let's say you get to the point now, Andrew, where uh, Quinn's no, tier three operation, which I heard he went down from number two to three in that conversation, which I like. But, yeah, yeah I, I noticed that, by the way. Not only <laughs> no, did no, I no, lose I a third battle, but I, I went from number two to number three, Andrew. So I don't no, know no, no, what's no, no, happening no. here. I, I, I just figured it, was, it would be more interesting if we made you seem a little bit more like the underdog, you know. Well, clearly I am the underdog. So Kinsley, go ahead, make, make your points. So you Quinn is a uh, gift. Quinn, Quinn is a distant third to my number one top tier slot. Yeah. Okay. Now, now you, my, my head is, you're my just, head is hanging to the on. side because the crown on. is so heavy. Stop yes. it. Stop it. <laughs> and so Quinn's Quinn, number three, let's say that Quinn against the advice of his mother <laughs> did decide to go out and beat up on the little guys. And yeah. he feels like he's, sufficiently trounced his lower tier competition. Now he's in a position maybe to take on number two, which I also own, by the way. I, I expanded my business while he was focused on the little guys. <laughs> so I own two businesses that wanted to, but let's just say he's going to shift his focus over. How which, would he the then the right thing that you should have done? Yes. Right. How would he then think about approaching going after that top slot or that stronger okay. competitor? 
All right. So, so, so while you were like buying number two and expanding your scope so that you could fight at this wide area battle, which is what, when you're the leader, what you want to do is you want to expand the battlefield. So the little guys have much, uh, much more difficulty challenging you. So you did the right thing over at Kinsley's. But meanwhile, Quinn was cleaning up on all the, on the, uh, the other guys in the market. Here we go. Strength. What? I said, here we go. Here we go. So Here we now, go. if you follow, again, the, the principles and the strategy, what you need to figure out is, okay, what can I do either that's going to differentiate myself or create a situation where I can compete more one-on-one -on -one with uh, Kinsley or could throw them off, off his game where I can start to get an inroad. So, for instance, since now Kinsley has maybe has overexpanded, maybe he's created vulnerability. Maybe Kinsley's decided, you know what? I'm going to add a second brand by going into sleep shops, but I'm not very good in those sleep shops because I'm not enough of a specialist yet. There might be an opportunity to, uh, to pick off business there. Or I'm not, he's not very good in a certain price segment or with certain uh, aspects of service. Or you know what? He's very, he, now that he's become like big and bad, he gets very predictable with his promotion plan. You know already, you've mapped it out exactly what he's going to do for every holiday. So you have an opportunity, for instance, be it maybe a direct mail campaign to launch a pre-holiday event with an offer that you know is going to be different and more attractive than what Kinsley is going to do. So what you have to start thinking about is what are those weak points of your competitor that you can start to pick off? So I've broadened the battlefield and he's having to fight a multi-front war. So he's going to find a point of penetration that he can yes. attack. He knows it's a seam. It's a weakness in my front. Go yeah. after that and then strategically repeat that process based on the, the weaknesses that I display. Yeah. Yeah. So um, going back to uh, Lanchester and there's two theories, right? There was the ancient hand-to-hand -hand combat and there was the modern warfare with machine guns. So one of the, so not only did he study battles in World War II, but he also studied ancient battles. And so a couple of them he studied was one, the Battle of Thermopylae which uh, people might famously remember for the movie 300. Yeah, and the book uh, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield, phenomenal book. Right, so, um, so what, what happened there? Well, the, okay, so the Spartans, what they did is basically they said, I'm, I'm going up against this much bigger Persian army, but if I can squeeze them into this one pass, they can't fight their whole army against me. They can only fight a limited number of people. Now, of course, in the movie 300, the Spartans, you know, obviously – they have better access to health clubs and things like uh, steroids and creatine than the Persians do. So they're also stronger fighters than, um, uh, than the Spartans. But that was a way, I mean, than the Persians. But that was a way to say, I'm going to concentrate my effort in one other place. The other one he looked at is the Battle of Traf Trafalgar, which was a, uh, a naval battle where an undermanned uh, British fleet defeated, I think, a combined Spanish-French uh, armada. And what they did there is they divided up their, uh, the opposing fleet so they took all their forces and only put it against part of the opposing fleet at one time, knocked them off, and then knocked off the rest of it. So what you have to think about is look at your competition and think about what are their weak points. Everybody has a weakness. You know, it goes back and, to and if, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I think you're right. And then if you're looking at this kind of experience, yeah. like if you have a, a big number one, if they expand that way, making an assumption, yeah. maybe they can't control the in-store experience as much because they've got so many stores, it's very difficult to do that. So you can win yep. doing it that way. So I want to, I want to shift gears, Andrew, because we had talked about it too. Um, in terms of like one of the important things for people today is the buy local thing. I think yes. you're completely right about that. Um, Mark and I do a lot of work inside of nationwide and we're huge fans of the independent retailer. And we think that there is a, a big opportunity for independent retailers to flex in their local market. But again, if, if a independent retailer isn't talking about it, just like the review sites, if you're not educating your people that, hey, a lot of these review sites are full of it and it's, they're just you know, trying to get you to go buy and there's a link and they make money mm -hmm. off of the content. If they're not educating people or they're not owning the message of, hey, listen, we are local, we are supporting your kids' little league, mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of things in this community, buy here and this is why. If they're not saying that stuff, then they're giving up that ground to the big box and the e-commerce guys, right? So yes. um, talk to us a little bit about buying local and the opportunity may be there for the, the retailers out there today. Yeah, you know, I'll use an example. So um, 
totally outside the industry. So there's a, uh, close to us is kind of a, a, you know, a garden and nursery center that's a family owned business, been in the business for 70 something years. They have their own like farm where they grow a lot of their stuff up in Wisconsin or whatever. And they got shut down in COVID. But uh, unlike the, uh, you know, some of their big box competition like Home Depot and Lowe's that were able to stay open because they were deemed essential. But what they did is, is they maintained, uh, you know, incredible uh, communications with people via email. They were able to, before they could reopen, they were able to kind of create kind of an, um, kind of an appointment, uh, kind of consulting basis that they could help you set up what your garden plan was going to be. So when they were open, you know, they would be able to sell you and supply you stuff. They reaffirmed and talked about stories about how they had been part of the community and all the great things that they were doing, not only for their employees, for the community. So it was all about that connection. So then when they were able to reopen and they reopened with a very clear message about how they were going to keep both their employees um, and, um, uh, you know, and customers safe, they had just, uh, you know, incredible traffic and response. So it goes back to that thing about people were open to buying local, but it's on you as a retailer to really show why you should do that. And part of that is you have to have, you know, you need to be a bigger part of the community with messaging that connects people on a different emotional level than just the product or the service. You know, it's also, there's a little lesson in there, I think also about building it before you need it. Yeah. You know, if they did not have a list of people and, were, and they weren't creating meaningful content, they wouldn't have that connection with people where they could then for, com, therefore communicate what was happening in their business and why they mattered. And right. so they had the, those, those points of connection with their community. And yeah, it's, it's, it's this principle of building value in everything you do. And I, you know, I talked to lots of independent retailers and I remember for years I would talk to people and they said, it, it, we're different because we're a family business. And I said, just about everybody has a family. So, what makes it different? And, and they talked about the connection they create with people. And so I, you know, I would tell people then, then put your family out there. You have to prove what you're saying. You can't just say it. People don't believe it. So prove it in everything you do visually, put your family on the radio, put your family on social media up on your website and build value in what that means and how you having a family that's connected to people is going to be the best place to do business and why that matters. Right. We dealt with that sort of, you know, we had the America's Mattress Division and we dealt with a lot of independent uh, family operators. And one of the key messages that we'd have for them is you have to make that, that's part of your point of difference, but you can't just, it's not just words on the, on the you know, on the sign on your store or um, at a point on your website. You actually have to act behind it. Um, and the other part to this garden center example is about building relationships. And that's one of the toughest things in this business. Um, and I think it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I have concerns about the betting specialist model over time is the ability to build a relationship with your customer when you have such a longer purchase cycle. Mm. I think if you're in the furniture and appliance business, you have a real opportunity because you can supply more things for the home that you need, need to be investing in and in building a, an ongoing relationship with your customer because they have many reasons to come back. I think where the specialty sleep model has somewhat uh, suffered in this growth of e-commerce is what's, what's the basis upon which I'm building a long, longer term relationship with my customer. Um, and I think that's something that you have to really think about hard because in the other day, especially these days, consumers are only going to trust or give, their time and effort to retailers for which they think that there's some sort of exchange of value and relationship and that, and there's value in that relationship. Yeah. It, it's pretty one dimensional. When you think about the purchase cycle, you think about lifetime value of a customer, how you can maintain a relationship with them. You know, there might be only so much that somebody wants to hear about sleep health. Whereas if you have a store with a variety of merchandise, that has a lot of different potential meaningful connections and emotional connections you create. Then you have content, then you have a conversation, then you have an ongoing relationship. Yeah, but so we're talking about two things though. We're talking about frequency, right, Andrew? Yeah. So to your point, the sleep shop has, is at a disadvantage because you're selling a mattress and the replacement cycle is like, you know, takes time. 
Right. But the other part of it is connection, Kinsley, you said it earlier, and I think that's really the more important part of this. It's, it is, what is your ability to serve the, the consumer in a way that takes you away from being a place to conduct a transaction to being a place that's adding value to their life, that's serving them, that understands and the selling process is legit. Um, you walk in, you really feel like they're trying to help you sleep better because of the difference it's gonna make in your quality of life instead of just going into a place to buy something, which is what a lot of people are doing. They're just selling things. So if the connection to the consumer is good because the experience is authentic and real and helpful, then you build that bridge and, and, and create an opportunity for a long-term relationship with them. But a lot of people are just transactional these days, don't you think, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think, and that, that's unfortunately what a lot of people kind of built their retail model on this industry was a transactional model that was based on convenience, that was based on being accessible within a few miles of your home. And the internet changed that because basically the internet's uh, accessible, you know, um, you know, a few inches from my fingertips at all times. And so you have to evolve to something beyond that. And I think the challenge there is going to be, and it's not just in this category, in a lot of categories they see, do these category killer specialists that were really built around kind of convenience and value, how do they sustain themselves in a world where people are going to want more and more relationships? And so the difference is, if I have a broader portfolio, I have more reasons to interact with people and be part of their lives. I have a platform that I can build on. Um, now, the holy grail there is to get into some sort of recurring revenue subscription service, but I haven't seen anybody figure that out yet in this category, um, because that's what, when you look kind of more broadly, for instance, in tech, that's you know where people are building a real value. Um, and who knows, you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, on, on the low end, mattress prices go down, might open the opportunity for some sort of subscription service. I mean, people have tried to figure that out, it hasn't worked yet. Um, but e either way, you know, the opportunity is to build, build a relationship and you've got to, you know, add value and emotion into that in order for people to, to, um, to want to engage. We kind of have what appears to be a subscription model whenever you have five year, 0% financing offers. It's kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If, if you're okay buying your friends, then yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think that's, you know, it's, it is one of, you know, for an industry that I think is in a bit of a, a state of flux, it is a challenge. How, how will retail evolve? What will happen on the manufacturer landscape between the large established players, um, all the low cost entrants and everybody in between? But at the end of the day, I think a lot of it's going to be about, you know, elevating the benefits in the category and finding a way to have a stronger relationship with, with your customer. And I do think retailers in many cases are in a better place to do that than sometimes brands are because you have more ways that you can um, interact and, and serve, serve your customer. I think that's a, it's a great kind of pause point for people to really absorb. Mm -hmm. As a retailer, are you in a better position than a brand, which is, pretty singular and focused for the most part. And I, you know, I tell you just from a, in a very small way, I saw this happen. I, I've had this apparel company for about five years that I started. It's direct to consumer e-commerce. Our whole thing is working out with your phone is an awful experience. So you can get rid of your armbands. We have pockets built into the shorts. It's a very niche audience. We have thousands of customers, but you get to the point where you're in the cycle of people want more of what you have. So you go from having to be a product brand to a product brand that's constantly innovating and introducing new products, or you become a curator and a merchandiser because the relationship doesn't have much of an extension around that one core product. Right. Right. It's very hard. And that's one of the things that the, um, you know, uh, going back to the Lanchester strategy, they talk about a little bit about kind of what's your path to, to growth and all that. And ultimately, you won't see a lot of discussion about product there. Because you have to assume over time that whatever you come up with in product, with some exceptions, is going to be matched in some way. It's actually one of the core tenets of a person in a position of strength or a company in a position of strength, you say, is copy immediately yes. what your weaker competitor did. Yes. 
And that was, yeah, yeah and that's something that people sometimes they get, um, uh, their ego gets in the way of that. Yeah, but one of the principles when you're a leader, any good idea that comes out in the market, you should copy it, make it a feature. Like Apple's great about that. People come up, for instance, with a, a great camera app on their phone. The next evolution of iOS has got those features built in. Or even look more broadly, look what the phone did to the whole photography industry, right? Uh, well, and we're really good at copying product yeah. in this industry, that's for sure. And right. so there's there's very little in terms of intellectual property or the, the, anything that's been yeah. discernibly different. So, Inter, as we kind of close it up, you've yeah. been really great. And... Um, we are very, very glad that you gave us the time today and we'll have to do this again because the three of us could probably talk for the rest of the day about this <laughs> crazy industry we're in and enjoy every minute of that. But um, just one last question I have for you um, and then I'll let Kinsley kind of close this out. But you know, what, is your, what is your hope for this industry? I mean, I know that you love the business. Uh, you were in it for a long time. You had a, a lot of great connections to retailers and the people at Serta. What, what, do you, what is your hope for the mattress industry over the next 12 months or a couple of years? Uh, what, what would you like to see happen? Uh, it's a great question. I think uh, one, um, well, I, I, I'll just capture it this way. I think this is a tremendous moment of opportunity, as I said, between the impact of COVID on the home, anti-dumping coming in, the focus on wellness, et cetera. And I would, what I would like to see is that the industry seizes the moment because it's very easy to see how it could continue to kind of progress along the way of more movement towards low cost, uh, quick replacement cycle products versus the real opportunity to capture more of the value that really should be in, a sleep, uh, in, in the sleep category related to health and wellness. And so that's to me the hope, hope for the industry is to, you know, that you're in the midst of a unique opportunity, a gift that's been given. Now the opportunity is how do you seize on it to create value for you, uh, for your customers, and ultimately for your owners. And I'll tell you what we'll do as you think about yeah. how you can create those opportunities for the industry and for your business. We'll put some of the notes that Andrew made for us yeah. on the website associated with the podcast, this podcast. So if you just go to mattresspodcast.com, go to the search and just search for Andrew Gross, this podcast or the two-parter will pop up. And some of the notes from the Lanchester strategy model are going to be in there. Everything from the two laws to the three principles that Andrew distilled down. So you can start applying that framework in your business. And hopefully, like you said, use this as an opportunity. And, and beyond that, Andrew, how can people get in touch with you? And we'll put some links up as well. Uh, sure. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter at ASG25. You can, uh, you know, we'll put my, uh, my email contact in there. But uh, happy to talk to people as they reach out. Uh, you know, as you said, as Mark said, feedback's a gift. And always happy to be a sounding board. Well, we appreciate you, Andrew. Thanks for being on the show and best of luck and we'll talk with you here soon. Yes. Thanks guys.